And let's continue through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and we begin the book of Isaiah tonight. With the book of Isaiah, we begin the fourth of what are five major divisions of the Old Testament. There is the Pentateuch, which is the Law of Moses. Then there are the historical books, and then the poetical books, and then the major prophets, which we begin tonight with Isaiah. He is the first of the major prophets, and then the minor prophets. Let me tell you a little bit about Isaiah. Uh, We'll pick it up as we go through, not tonight, but over the long haul, a little bit about him, but it's good to know some things about him to begin with. He was a prophet. A prophet, what that simply means, a prophet is someone who speaks for God. Uh, So often today we talk about prophecies and uh, prophetic things, and in a sense in which it's used in the world, it's someone who tells the future. Well, prophecy can have that element of it, but... Basically, a prophet is just someone that God calls to stand up and to speak for him. And that's what Isaiah was. That was his office. He was a prophet. He was a contemporary of Hosea and Micah, for those of you who like to put these kinds of things together. He was married. Those of you who are wives and you read about what Isaiah went through in his (laughs) ministry... uh, you know, in all of us, we realize there were wives and children involved in all of this. And so he had a wife, was married, and he had two sons. He ministered over a period of at least 40 years, probably uh, 41 years at least. And uh, some estimate that he ministered as long as 60 years, depending on, uh, you know, as they read the kings and how long he might have gone into each of their reigns. Isaiah ministered, and he was a prophet. He was a person that spoke to God's people from the Lord in a very critical time in in Judah's history. Uh, The nation of Israel had broken into two parts because of the folly of Solomon's son. The northern kingdom became Israel, and the southern kingdom became Judah. And and, uh, Isaiah's prophecies were directed towards the southern kingdom of, of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel never had a single good king. Never had a single good king. And they went into captivity to the Assyrians long before the southern kingdom went into captivity to the Babylonians. They both went into captivity for the same reasons, for turning their back upon God, but one group went more swiftly because their uh, descent into sin was was, uh, so much uh, more steep. But while... Isaiah, when he was prophesying, his prophesying, his ministry took place from about 740 B.C. to about 680 B.C. And Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, fell into captivity at about 722 B.C., so about in the middle of his ministry. And so he had a chance to watch the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel into the hands of the Assyrians, the cruel hands of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were ruthless. When they would go in and wipe out a city or take a country, they would kill not only kill everyone in the city, but they would take their heads and then pile them into like pyramid mounds at the front of the city, and they would peel the skin off of the people and line the whole walls of, of the city with the skin of, of the people that they had taken. Listen, when God says that the stakes are high as it relates to obeying Him. He means it. When He calls the devil a roaring lion seeking whom He may devour, He means it. And when He talks about the end of sin and what's there, He he doesn't... Sin isn't bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. God knows where it leads. He knows where it ends. He knows what happens to even His people if we immerse ourselves into sin. And imagine as He saw that coming upon His people, the ruthlessness of the Assyrians, and so easy for them not to fall into captivity, but just to simply turn to God and say, we have sinned, we have fallen from you, we repent tonight and we turn back to you, and everything in their history would have changed. That can happen in a heart in five seconds. That can happen in a nation in five seconds. How it must have broken the heart of God. These Assyrians come in and slaughter His people in that way, but they wouldn't turn. 
And I'll tell you, when the Assyrians were laying siege to that northern kingdom, and their armies were there with their bonfires and laying siege to the cities and the destruction of the city, the capitals and the main cities of the northern kingdom, just 22 miles away from Jerusalem, they could have just gone up on their rooftops and looked out and saw what hap- was happening to their brethren because of their failure to turn. And yet as Isaiah ministers to this another group, that same of the God's people there in the southern kingdom of Judah, for all of those years, for all that happened to the northern kingdom, he couldn't get them to turn. And finally, a hundred years after his ministry, under the prophecies of Jer- Jeremiah, they would ultimately fall to the Babylonians in, in what would be a- another cruel, cruel, uh, you know, torturous kind of sieges that, that the Babylonians would lay upon God's people. But imagine that, that you could go any time up on your roof or the, up onto the walls of the city and look out and say, there is the end of sin. There's the end of rebellion. And then to turn to rebellion myself. And so here is Isaiah. He's trying, they're living these shallow, frivolous lives when real life and real destruction is coming at them and he couldn't move them. Couldn't move them. And so, you know, a critical time where he was calling for repentance. When God calls us to repentance, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. And so, that was what Isaiah was in the middle of. Now, Jewish tradition tells us that Isaiah was ultimately uh, martyred for his uh, faith in God and for his faithful declaring of the Word of God. It's said that Manasseh, as he was denouncing Manasseh, Manasseh, one of the worst kings that uh, Judah ever had, as he was denouncing the uh, sinfulness of Manasseh, that Manasseh stuffed him in a log and then cut the log in two with Isaiah. And it's believed that in... um, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, when it talks about the great hall of faith and being sawn in two for your faith, that that's perhaps a reference to Isaiah. But very, very likely that he was uh, suffered a martyr, martyrdom in his faithfulness to God. The theme of the book, the message of the book is important to understand. And the message is a simple one. It's the holiness of God. On every page, it just reminds us time after time after time that God is holy. And the most usual title for God in the book of Isaiah is the Holy One of Israel. I tell you, it's just chapter after chapter after chapter. The Holy One of Israel, 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 the Holy One of Israel. Israel, As God was trying to get the attention of His people back upon His holiness and not the madness and the sinfulness of of the world around him. Now, the tone of much of the book is one of judgment, one of justice. And and that's the problem is, is that when God's people will not turn away from their sin, they continue in their rebellion. Well, when that rebellion then comes into contact with the holiness of God, it can only turn into justice. It can only turn into judgment. And so there's that continual theme of, of judgment in it, and almost always the prophecy of judgment that comes through Isaiah in his book, it's followed by a vision of the future and a prophecy concerning peace. In other words, when God takes and He declares His judgment, He always wants His judgment to turn into peace. He doesn't want to stay the judge. He doesn't want to be the judge in my life. He wants to be the provider of peace in my life. And so, so always given that chance when there was that judgment, he would then follow it with a prophecy concerning the future when there would be repentance. And, and then he'd get to reveal his heart, what he really wanted to do for his people, what he really wants to do in this world if he's given half a chance to. Another theme that is a part of the book of Isaiah is the theme of salvation. In fact, Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation, or the salvation of Yahweh. The term salvation occurs 26 times in the book of Isaiah and in his prophecies. And the interesting thing, you say, well, gosh, it's not that m- many for, you know, uh, 66 chapters. But if you take all of the other prophets together, the word salvation only occurs seven times. 
And so 26 times in his prophecies, salvation. And the book of Isaiah is quoted 21 times in the New Testament. Well, that would make sense when the theme is salvation. And the New Testament is about God's salvation. Isaiah's prophecies can contain some most incredible prophecies concerning the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who is to come. Verse 1 of chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which... He saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, and the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. His prophecies, his ministry, um, went on through that, these, the period of all of these kings. Now, the first five chapters of Isaiah um, deal with uh, I, uh, Isaiah's ministry under the reign of Uzziah. And it's important to understand a little bit about Uzziah and, and the whole uh, tone of what he was uh, coming against really there in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uzziah was one of the greatest kings that the southern kingdom of Israel ever had. And he reigned for 52 years. When you got a good king, you'd like him to reign that long. You know, you can re keep re-electing him. But I mean, in there, there you, you became the king. If you had a lousy king, you were stuck with him until he died. And, uh, and you had a good king, you never wanted him to die. And Uzziah was a great king. He reigned for 52 years. And under his reign, he was a godly man in his ministry and in his being the king. He wiped out the idolatry in the land. He did everything that he could to turn the people back to God. And, uh, and yet, for all that he did, the hearts of the people still remain very, very far from God. You know, a leader can't change the hearts of the people, and the people can't change the hearts of a leader. You know, people do what they're going to do themselves. But he did what was best uh, that, that, that he could do in faithfulness to God. And in his faithfulness to the Lord, the southern kingdom of Judah was incredibly prosperous. Uh, I tried to get the numbers on their stock market. Uh, in that day, but I'm sure it was going through the roof, and it was a tremendous time, prosperity, everyone was making lots of money, it was a, a tremendous time materially, and his name became equated with security too, an expansion. The southern kingdom of Judah expanded under his reign, and, and, uh, and there was tremendous security. Nobody even thought of being taken over under, under his reign because of his godliness and because of his leadership. And so the Bible says that Uzziah prospered as long as he sought the Lord. Now, there's a problem with prosperity. Prosperity is one of the hardest things you and I will deal with as Christians. There you think, boy, you know, I wish I had this or I wish I had that and then and that. Some of those times that can be the hardest things to deal with within our lives. Or when God really uses you. And um, one of the hardest things to deal with is when you've gone to do something for the Lord and it seemed like he stayed home and you were there all alone, you know, trying to do it. That can be rough. And then also, he's, it's never the case. It's about walking by faith. And then there are times where you go and he uses you and it's just so obvious that he's used you. You got to deal with that. And there's a special way that you have to deal with that, that kind of prosperity. But he became lifted up in pride because of, of how God was using him so mightily. And it wasn't enough for him just to be the king. One day he walked in and to the temple there and he walked in with the priest and he decided that he was going to offer some sacrifices. Well, that was a, that's a capital offense under the law. You just can't, you know, Molary and Curly just can't go in there and offer sacrifices. You had to be, you know, uh, uh, descendants of Aaron. You had to be a Levite. You just couldn't go in and do that. He just walks in and decides, hey, God's using me in this way. Man, I can do anything I want. And he went in there and the high priest took in 80 priests with him to confront him and it said these were Mighty men of valor. I mean, these priests were rough guys, you know, and, and they came and they confronted him. And he was very upset that they confronted him with what he was doing as, as being wrong. And, and as he became angry against them, it says, as his face became red with the anger, all of a sudden leprosy broke out on, on his forehead. Now, there's only one thing worse than being a non-priest trying to offer sacrifices in the temple. And that's being a non-priest trying to offer sacrifices in the temple when you got leprosy breaking out on your face. Because that was something that would make anything unclean. And so they rushed him out of the temple. And for the rest of his life, he was separated because of his leprosy. And, and then he died in that, in that isolation and his son began to reign in his stead. But overall, a tremendous 
tremendous rain, and the people of God uh, were blessed as, as a result of it. And that's kind of the, the scene that Isaiah is ministering in. Um, he's ministering in a deal where there's uh, uh, tremendous prosperity and there's a surface religion uh, and an acknowledgement of God, but it's not deep in the people's lives. It's not deep in their life at all. Politically, it was a time where all of the superpowers were trying to defeat one another for world domination. Now, I know that this is totally weird outside of our thinking in our lifetimes for that kind of thing happening, but it, early on in Isaiah's reign, the Assyrians and the Egyptians were fighting for world domination. And then at the end of his reign, the Assyrians and the Babylonians were. So there was a constant fight. And uh, Judah was kind of like a, a nice plate on the table that each of them wanted to kind of eat. And so the only place they could, way they could be safe is if they uh, walked with the Lord. And he would, he would keep them and take care of them. And, and so very much like today, everyone wanting to... Uh, rule the world, as the silly song goes. All right, verse 2. Uh, God begins to give his assessment of the nation of Judah and their wickedness. He said, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. He calls heaven and earth as a witness to what he's going to say. He couldn't call anybody else except Isaiah. Nobody else was listening to him. So he says, I'll t I know who is listening to me. Heaven and earth is listening to me. And he calls them as a witness to the truth of what it is that he's going to say. And I love that as he, as he talks about that. And he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. And there's the, the sense of what he's saying is, I'm going to speak, and when I speak, everyone should listen. Everything should shut down. And I like that, and I need to hear that in my life. I need to hear that related to the Word of God. When we really believe the Word of God to be the Word of God, I mean, everything ought to shut down in the face of it. You know, it's, it, it, and here it is. He's, he's going to speak. And, and so there ought to be no competition as it relates to that. And, that, and that's what he's also what he's saying. Is everything... When, when, as soon as God opens His mouth, I mean, everything ought to go completely silent in the face of that. And, and, and yet nobody's even listening to Him in Judah. He said, I've nourished and I've brought up children. Speaking of... Uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. And have they responded? They've rebelled against me. He said, the ox knows its owner, and oxes are, are known for submission. And he said, the donkey knows its master's crib. Donkeys are known for their stupidity. So he says, even you know, the stupidest animal uh, understands where its food's, food comes from. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. They got all of this wealth, all of this food, all of this everything, and they were uh, not acknowledging that it had... Uh, come from God. And God was telling the nation of Israel, He is in effect saying that they were re not only rebellious, but they were ungrateful in their rebellion. They weren't acknowledging Him, acknowledging His blessings. In fact, He blessed them and they responded with even greater rebellion against Him. Utterly illogical. doesn't make any sense to do it that way. But that's what He's saying. He's saying, My people are worse than animals. That's something. <laughs> and we have to remember, he's not talking about the world. Ooh, that bad old world out there. He's not talking about, you know, the pagans or anything like this. He's talking about his people here. And he's saying they are worse than animals. Even the most non-thinking of animals don't do to their master what my people have done to me. He said any animal will respond with thanksgiving to food. When I got to feed my little cocker spaniel, that's the happiest dog in the whole world at that moment in their life. Now, it's, that's their peak moment in, in life, and the day is kind of sad. And that, you know, so I mean, they're not, they're not brilliant. I, I never, you know, had to worry about saving money to send little Abby to MIT or anything like that. But she's always appreciative. She knows where the food comes from and uh, makes me feel pretty perky, you know, when she, when, when she does. And, and, and so here is God with His people. He blesses them and they responded with rebellion. Then He talks about their wickedness and He says, Alas, a sinful nation, a nation full of sin, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, 
children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger. And then notice now, as he invokes his name, his title in this book, the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Now, in verse 4, he lists seven things about them. And, and seven characteristics of their wickedness. Now, in the Bible, the number seven is the number of completion. It's God's way of saying they are completely wicked. Completely. And he's talking about his people. And what a terrible list he gives there in verse 4. Completely wicked and turned away from God. And then God speaks to them in verse 5. And he said, why should you be stricken again? You'll revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints from the sole of the foot. He likens them to a body, even to the head. There's no soundness in it, but there's wounds and bruises and pussy sores. And they have not been closed up or bound up or soothed with ointment. And so he looks at them and he's been disciplining them and he's been chastening them. But he says they're unteachable. He said there isn't another place on you to discipline you. There's not another clean spot on you to, you know, to try and get through to you on. And I'll tell you, it's, it's difficult when, when we're raising our children and they reach a point in their rebellion where there's not, there's like, there's not one more thing you can take away from them. There's not, it's, it's like there's not one more thing you can do, uh, you know, except for ether. And uh, whatever might thing, you know, we're not far from that. I mean, in terms of drug use on some of this stuff. But, but you know, it's a tough spot when their rebellion is so deeply ingrained that nothing, you can't do anything that will get their attention. That's just a rough spot. You look at it and you go, man, uh, judgment's coming. I don't know from what quarter, but it's coming. It's a, it's a, it's a horrifying condition for a parent as it relates to a child. And this is what he likens the nation to. There's nothing. I've done everything I know to get through to you, and you won't listen to me, is, is what he's saying to them. Now, they already have watched, and what he's describing in verses 4 and 5 is he's basically describing the body of a leper. He's describing their king. Describing their king. And as they've watched their king go to where there's no soundness on his body, there's no, you know, in terms of the king's pride and his rebellion against God and all of that and the consequences of it, he's saying, you're just like your king. That's what you're, you're like. And I'm sure that King Uzziah was the subject of a lot of conversations in Judah. And maybe they talked about his pride and look at how the haughty man and look at how God judged him and all of that. And they saw themselves as entirely different from Uzziah. And yet God was speaking to them, I think, in this particular part of it. And he was saying, you're just like him, you just don't see it. Your condition is more dangerous, though, because his is physical and yours is spiritual. And so... They're in that unteachable kind of a, of a condition that they're in. And then in verse 7, he says, Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In other words, he describes the future as if it had already happened. And God is able to do that. And this came true. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence. And it is desolate. It's overthrown by strangers. And so the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard. In other words, absolutely unprotected. They're going to be, he's saying, you got all this wealth. You don't know you're going to be stripped of it in a night. And as a hut in the garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. So he says you're, you're going to be utterly wiped out if you don't turn back to me. And then in verse 10, he begins to denounce their religious activity, their hypocrisy. He said through Isaiah, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now, um, Picture yourself as one of the religious rulers in, uh, in Jerusalem. And Isaiah comes and says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. And, and in fact, in the Revelation, God in the Great Tribulation, is, it refers to 
um, Jerusalem as Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet their pride would not allow them to accept that. They looked and they thought to themselves, we are God's chosen people. This is where His temple is. This is where He's made His capital. And Sodom was this terrible, you know, vile, wicked group of people. We're so different from them that, that you know, that it, 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 there's no mistaking the two. And yet God comes and says, the same sins that characterize Sodom and Gomorrah before their destruction is characterizing in terms of just the sin just permeating every portion of society. And so he calls them that. And I'll tell you, when God comes to a religious leader and he calls him a ruler over Sodom, imagine God coming to me in the middle of the night and saying to me related to this church, oh, pastor of Sodom, I mean, listen, you, you better listen. I'm not, say, I'm not saying that he said that. So, so relax. <laughs> Boy, did it get heavy in here? I mean, so... But I mean, imagine that you're either going to accept that and fall on your face and repent, or you're going to rebel against that and you're in for, you know, you're in for big trouble. And it's really, you know, sometimes I pick up the newspapers and I pick up the magazines and I see these uniformed religious grand poobahs that hold millions of people under their sway. And what they're about is anything and everything other than the Lord Jesus. And so the same warnings are for today. It's awesome, you know, today. And, and so he comes and he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. And then he goes from the leaders then to the people. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. He said, when you come to appear before me, and it's kind of like when you come to the temple, you come to church, who required this from your hand? Who told you you had to come here to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Now imagine God speaks now to these people and He says, I don't want anything to do with your sacrifices anymore. He just refuses them. They have this religious machine in high gear. All right, it's time to go to church, time to do this, time to do this, time to do this, all of this, light the candles, do that, and everything, all right. And then uh, do the different things and, and all, and then and, and, and God, in, in all of the offering of the sacrifices, living completely lives of rebellion to God. And God said, who told you? Who ever constrained you to bring sacrifices to me, living that kind of a life? He doesn't want it. He even gets heavier as he goes along. He talks about their incense. He says, incense is an abomination to me. They offered their incense, which symbolized their prayer to God. And, and so God says, your incense or your prayers are an abomination to me because they don't reflect your heart. They don't reflect, they don't reflect your heart and they, they don't reflect your life. And so they, basically the people had become spiritual actors. Uh, you know, business was business, church was church, and you know, two different kind of lives, and you do what you have to do to get by, and that kind of thing. And it was all acting. It was all acting. And God said, I see through the act, and I'm not interested in it. I don't want any more sacrifices, and I don't want any more prayers like that. I don't want any, any more incense being lifted up. The new moons, the Sabbaths, these holy days, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. He said, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates, and they're a trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, and this is talking about prayer, I'll hide my eyes from you, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Imagine that. Full of blood. Oppressing people killing people, whether instantaneously or just bleeding them to death, you know, through oppression or whatever. And, and, and you know, over here as I uh, own the apartment complex and I'm taking advantage of the poor and then coming in and raising my hands, you know, to God and all. And God says, I see the whole picture. Don't do that to me. I'll tell you, one of the things that I want to do if the Lord um, allows us to uh, build that new church out there on, on Bangs, somewhere in that building, I want to put a couple of banners or something up there. Uh, I, I have to be careful. I don't say banners or put something up because I, um, I don't know much about interior stuff. So I don't want to spoil it. 
But there's two words I want to have up in front of us all of the time as, as people in this church because I want them before my own eyes all of the time. And that's the word reality and eternity. I want those before me all of the time. And that's all God was wanting from them was just reality. Just reality. Be what you are out there, what you are in here. And be in here what you are out there. But don't, don't have two different kinds of lives. Just be real. And I tell you, the longer we walk with the Lord, sometimes the harder that is to be. Because, again, as I've spoken before, you kind of learn things. You learn how to do it. You learn how to say it. You learn how to... All these kinds of things. You begin to think, well, this isn't really compromise. It's amazing how things that we just viewed early in our walk as being absolute compromise. There's no you know, question about it. And then you find a believer eight years later, five years later, ten years later, and their life is permeated with the things that once you know, revolted them as a brand new Christian. And, and so the importance of there being just reality. All God wanted was just reality, but He didn't want this acting thing going on. And of course, eternity, to live my life in the light of eternity. Not in the light of my three score and ten, or my retirement, or however long I think I'm going to live, but to live my life now for the, in the context of eternity. And they, and they weren't doing that. And so God looks at it and He says, I don't want anything to do with it. I, 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 I hate it. Have you ever had uh, someone come up to you and uh, make a show of liking you when they really don't? <laughs> Someone comes up and they make a show of liking you and the whole time you know it's phony. Is there anything in the world harder to bear than that? You just want to get one of that, you know? <laughs> and that's what God is saying. You know, I know the whole thing. I know the whole thing is phony. This is it's hard. If you didn't come, I'd be better off. If you left me alone in my temple, I'd be better off than, than all of this stuff. And so, you know, a very, very strong warning. And then in verse 16, he calls them to repent. He says, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Put away the evil uh, of your doing from before my eyes. He saw everything that was going on. He said, cease to do evil. And these are just good little simple things. Just stop doing evil. And now learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the oppressor. Don't encourage them. And defend the fatherless and plead for the widow, the, the helpless within the society. And so he calls them to repent. And beautiful thing, he gives this strong warning and then he extends grace to them. He said, come now and let's us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, and they were. And the word scarlet means to be double dyed. He said, though your sins are double dyed, you have no chance of removing them yourself. They shall be white as snow, and though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so, um, the, you know, this is what he calls them to. If you're willing, and I love that word, if, and, and uh, uh, he's offering this pardon, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You can forget about the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and, and uh, all of the other evil things in the world. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so God calls them, wants to reason with them. He said, let's be reasonable. Look at my offer. Your sins are like scarlet... I'll make them white as snow. He, he says, he, I'll make them as snow. He said, your sin is as crimson and I'll make it white. He said, who in their right mind would turn down that offer? That's, no one, I mean, that is, he's saying, be reasonable. Look at the offer that I'm making to you to turn back to me, giving you that opportunity to, to turn. He said, the only unre thing that's unreasonable is not my offer, but that anyone would turn down my offer. And I say, it reminds you of John 3.16, doesn't it? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not unreasonable to trust in the Lord Jesus and to trust in God's forgiveness and His grace. What is unbelievable and what is unreasonable is that anyone would turn away from that offer of grace. And so He wants them to turn. I'll tell you, repentance is a privilege. 
to hear God's voice is a privilege. And if you're in that place tonight, whether you're backslidden or you've gone into sin or rebellion against God or whatever it might be, to hear God's voice tonight for you to turn and His willingness to lavish you with grace, to hear His voice is pure grace on His part. And the failure to listen to Him, the consequences will be catastrophic. And so He warns of the seriousness of it. There's grace, there's space to repent, but... Uh, uh, they don't know how long, and they should have taken God up on it. And then in verse 21, he says, How the faithful city has become a harlot. And um, it, now he's going to start to talk about where, how Jerusalem has become a place where money ruled rather than righteousness. And uh, what is true of Jerusalem can be true of an individual heart. And so he said, how the faithful city, Jerusalem, once used to be a city that was known for righteousness, doing what was right, no matter what the financial cost might be. But he said, now it's become a harlot. What is a harlot? Someone who sells themselves for money. They sold out their righteousness and their holiness and their purity. They sold out for money. They sold out for money. And so he, he, he brings this to the surface. It was full of justice. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murders. Your silver has become dross. Your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious. The companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. It's all corrupt. It's all about money. And they do not defend the fatherless, which is the right thing to do, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. And so all of the decisions not being made on the basis of what, what is right and wrong, but what's, you know, what is uh, financially expedient. And uh, I'll tell you, I look at the world today. I look at what's happened just in the last few years in the United States of America and how the money is ruling. I said it would be that way in the Revelation, though. Talked about spiritual Babylon and commercial Babylon. You're going to see as the end times continue to develop, you watch the money. And the money's going to rule. The money's going to rule over the nations. And you watch the corporations getting so big and they're getting so rich and so powerful that now they can hold entire nations hostage and say, all right, you're going to give us a bad time about an unrighteous practice, then we will take our factories and we will go someplace else. And then everyone, you know, kind of cows down to them. I hope that's not a bad word. But they, you know, they bow down to them on the thing and they, they compromise their stand in order to hold on to the money. China is a place that really troubles me because I've got hundreds of millions of family there. And it, it's troubling to me that we will take and put the economic side of things above what is right and what is wrong. And the interesting thing is we can do it for a little while from the insulation of our wealth and of our military power, but one day you will sell, that will be gone. And then all of those, then what you'll be, we'll be looking around for is we'll be looking around for someone in the world to stand up for us in our depleted condition. And we'll be hoping and praying, is there a nation somewhere in the world that will make a decision related to us based upon what is right and what is wrong because what is being done to us is wrong rather than be having decisions made upon what is financially best. And then we'll have no right to, you know, clamor and complain when no one rises up and makes that stand because we aren't making that stand. And I'd rather eat less. I'd rather have less. I'd rather have everything less as it relates to the comforts of life and be right as it relates to the handling of real human lives by the hundreds of millions around the world. It's a serious place we're in. We're watching the world sell out every day in greater measure because of the power of money. And just because it's going to happen, and the Scriptures say that that's what's going to happen, doesn't mean that we have to be a part of, of the tide. Now, we can go all around the world. It doesn't have, just have to be China. China just uh, comes to mind because of, uh, you, know, you know why. I mean, it's just there at the, at the front of, 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 of everything these days. But, uh, but that's the thing. They just sold out for the, you know, for the, the money. 
And uh, we have to be careful in our own lives that our principles, what's right and what's right for the other person, is what guides our decisions and not what is financially best and easy for us. Verse 24, Therefore, in light of all of this, the Lord says, The Lord of hosts, the Mighty One of Israel, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance upon my enemies. And he says, all right, I'm going to clean house. And I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross. And the only way you can purge away dross is hot judgment. And I'll take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. I'm going to take you through a deep, hot trial in order to turn you back to what you once were. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitence with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors, uh, transgressors and of sinners shall be together. And those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed, for they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees, their shrines that they worship their false gods with, which you have desired, and you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you have chosen. Again, they were worshiping their false gods. Yeah, I've got this, uh, you know, I love the Lord and all that, and I go to temple all the time, and I go to church all the time, and then they got these secret places at their house where they're worshiping all of these other kinds of, of, of things. And, and so he says he's, day's going to come when he's going to make them uh, embarrassed of those gardens and ashamed of those terebinth trees. For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaf fades and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tinder and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together and no one will quench them. I think that as it relates to chapter 1, there's a couple of lessons that I want to bring out of it before we go into chapter 2 and, and then go through uh, chapter 6 tonight. Um, I think it's important for us to remember as we live as Christians in this world to remember that God watches this world. And it doesn't matter what you see or I see or what we think is right or what we think is wrong. There's the proverbial frog that gets boiled slowly in the water. You boil, put a boiling water on the, on the stove top. You throw a frog in that boiling water and it will jump out immediately. Put, it in a, put a pot of water on there and then put a frog in there and the cool water and then raise that temperature slowly enough and it will never notice that it's boiling to death and it will die in, in, that, in that pot. And so it's the same kind of thing that goes on with us. We're in the middle of all of this that goes on around us, not just in the world, but sometimes even within the spiritual settings. And we have to remember that all that really matters is how does God see the world? How does he see a nation? How does he see a life? I am shocked. And it's not a thing of, I'm better. I know what God called me out of. I know what I am capable of apart from the Lord. Scares me to death what I'm capable of apart from the Lord. But I don't have to be apart from the Lord the rest of my life. So you won't have to see that we trust. <laughs> but all that really matters... As I look at the world and I'm shocked by the world, I'm troubled by the condition of the world, how good is being called evil and evil is being called good, I can't even imagine how God sees this world from His position of holiness. I'm only troubled because He lives in me. And I'm just seeing through a glass darkly, one day face to face, can you imagine as he looks at the world from his purity and from his holiness and he sees every life taken, he sees every person ripped off, he sees every child molested, he sees every villager hacked to pieces, he sees every businessman ripping pe I mean, he sees all of it, all at once, and all of the world at one time, he sees it, what he must see in a day in this world. 
And, and, and that's, you know, as, as we look at the world, it's not what we think or what we don't think related to it. How can it be, as he looks at the world, that, he, it, that the world deserves anything other than the severest of judgment? And I don't contend that I don't deserve the greatest judgment of them all in the world. But I don't have to face it because of the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice. I don't have to face it. But I can look at this world today and blood on hands all over this world and say the only thing it deserves is judgment from top to bottom, from left to right. That's what it deserves. That's what it deserves. And the Bible teaches that it's coming. I think it's also important to understand as it relates to Isaiah that God had intended that through his people all of the world would have been blessed. That's why he raised up the Jews through the lineage of Abraham in order to bless the whole world. God said to Abraham, Genesis 12, he said, get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you. And I'll curse those who curse him who curses you. And in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. God desired not only to bless them, but that as they abode with God, as they, as they lived with God, as they lived for God, that their lives would become a blessing to the whole world. And as a nation, they had completely lost that bigger picture of what their life was supposed to be about. And their lives became all about themselves. All about themselves. All about their comfort and all about their money and all about their, you know, sinful expression of their flesh and all of those kinds of things. And they had lost sight of the world. And they had lost sight of God's purposes in the world and that He had called them out to be about those things, supremely about reaching the world, having the world come into contact with Him through them. And instead, they became a big bless me club. Just a big. Bless me, club. One of those. He delivered the sermon to them, but Matthew records he delivered the sermon to them with his eyes on the multitude. His eyes on the multitude. His eyes are always on the multitude. He speaks to us in Bible studies like this as we read our word every day, as we walk with Him. He speaks to us. He loves us. He wants to teach us. He wants to encourage us. But His eye is still on the multitude, the people that don't know what we know yet. They don't experience what we've experienced by His grace yet. His eye was on the multitude then, was on the multitude in Isaiah's time, in Jesus' time, and it remains on the, multi on the multitudes in our day. And so when He speaks into our lives, when He blesses our lives, it isn't in order that it would take us off the track of His call upon our lives, but in order that, that our lives might become a channel to then bless those that are around us so that they can understand that there's something supernatural about our lives and that, you know, they don't just talk about God and they don't just know some things about God, but God is in their midst of a truth. He's in their life. He's in their life. And so Jesus' eyes on the multitudes and the danger is, so often, is, again, we become self-consumed and, again, only worried about my blessings. And so, chapter 1, it speaks to us as the ch children of Israel. They weren't just going to pay a price for this. The whole world was paying a price. The whole world was paying a price for their rebellion. Are my eyes still on the multitude? Are my eyes still on the multitude? Have my eyes ever been on the multitude? Are my eye were my eyes once on the multitudes that God is trying to reach, and now they no longer are? Jesus wants our eyes to be on the multitudes. Do I still see them or am I self-consumed? Do I care about the fact that God's trying to bless the whole world through us and through the message that we get to carry? It's so important. We can look and say, yeah, well, they got involved in this and they got involved in that. They got involved in this and this sin and that sin because of their flesh and all of these kinds of things. The reason they ended up where they ended up was they were removed from what God had called them to do. Idle hands and idle minds are still the devil's workshop. 
One of the most important things to personal holiness is to stay busy about God's call upon our lives. It's, it keeps us out of so much trouble. I mean, he kills a lot of birds with that stone. Sorry, bird lovers. But, I mean, he really does. He not only makes our lives fruitful as he uses us, but it builds maturity into our life. Other people get to know the Lord, and we don't have any idea of the trouble that it keeps us out of, the temptations that it keeps us out of. I tell you, when I was a kid, I, all, I, all I needed was just a couple of hours of free time to destroy something. And my brother and I had a, it's a sad, it was a, my twin, two peas in a pod. We shot up every religious statue in our landlady's home. She had zillions of them. She was Catholic, and you got a BB gun, and glass is best. Glass are lizards. And uh, there they were, just sitting there, sitting on ledges, sitting everywhere. Blew all of them to smithereens. And uh, we, I mean, I don't even, I don't want to put anything in your heart, kids, in, but I mean, it just, it, w it wasn't good for us to be left alone. It wasn't good for us to have too much time. And I have convinced that I'm about the same today. And so, all of these things made the... <laughs> yeah, you guys, you're just like me, and I know it, so you stop it. So, but there was, all of that stuff was able to have that salt water intrusion, so to speak, into their life because they had lost sight of what their life was supposed to be like. And, and so, one of the great lessons related to this chapter.